welcome to uh, the Networking Friday for the Air Center. Um, as I said a little while ago, I'm Sheila Heymans, the Executive Director of the European Marine Board, and I will be the moderator today. Um, but it's obviously not about me. It's about um, the Isabel Sosa Pinto. She is going to be giving us a talk today on today, which is Biodiversity Day, International Biodiversity Day. She's going to give us a talk on marine biodiversity, which is quite appropriate. Um, so Isabel is a professor at the University of Porto, and she's the head of Aquatic Biodiversities uh, of the Aquatic Biodiversity um, and Conservation Group um, at the Centre for Marine Environmental Research, CIMAR. She's also a member uh, of their board of directors. Her research has mostly been on marine biodiversity and ecosystem functioning, um, focusing on seaweed. Um, she sits on uh, um, national and international steering committees such as Euromarine and um, the European Ocean Observing System, EOS, as well as the Atlantos project. Um, she's the co-chair of the MBON, um, so Marine Biodiversity Observation Network for GEOBON. Um, she's been working with IPBES, um, which is the International Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, um, and she supervises the scientific work of the platform. She's on the panel that does that. Um, she's got more than 180 scientific publications, and she's also a coordinating lead author for the Regional Assessment of Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services um, in Europe and Central Asia for IPBES. So with that, I want to thank um, Isabel for her time, and I will ask her now to, Isabel, do you want to put your video on and um, share your screen? That'd be great. Um, and over to you. Um, just for, before you do that, um, if you have any questions to Isabel, please, in the bottom of your screen, you see there's a question and answer. Please put your um, questions in, uh, in there and we will uh, try and address them after um, Isabel's talk. And uh, can I ask the other panelists to please put their videos off as well? Um, and other than that, thank you very much, Isabel. Take it away. Hello, good afternoon, uh, or good morning, depending where you are. Um, thank you. Uh, I would like first to invite uh, to, to start by um, thanking the Air Center for this invitation and also to um, yeah, and to talk about this marine biodiversity observations. <clears throat> uh, it was really a good uh, coincidence that this was today is Biodiversity Day. Um, and uh, we've, I've been working already uh, a bit with the Air Center. We have several things ongoing and now uh, we'll be talking uh, briefly about that too. Uh, I was like, I was asked to very briefly present my institute. So the CIMAR, that is the Center for Marine and Environmental Research. And um, so the, our mission, of course, is to uh, promote transdi transdisciplinary research and technology development, and also training associated with the University of Porto and other universities. And of course, we want to advance scientific knowledge, but not, uh, but not only that, to really contribute to sustainability of um, the management of the marine environment, marine and coastal, and also to, uh, to provide innovative solutions for oceans uh, economy. So our infrastructure is we have our main offices in uh, the building you saw, uh, but we also have a lot of offices in, in, at the university, different places, also in Lisbon and Madeira, and we have different partnerships also with some um, uh, other institutes in Portugal. And we are about to sign also one partnership with, uh, with the Air Center. Our research, we divided more or less in three lines, although we have a lot of collaboration between lines, uh, global challenge, change and ecosystem services, marine biotechnology and biology, and aquaculture. Um, and we have a lot of uh, work on knowledge transfer that we do with different partners um, um, this year at, at the national level. We have a lot of uh, training activities. We had a, a program of training for undergrads. Then we have now also for master students and we have now a PhD program. And we, uh, we collaborate 
with a lot of uh, programs that exist in the University of Porto and other uh, different universities. And we have some of these positions, actually the master that I saw before, they are funded by the industry. Uh, then we had the numbers, we had about 400 people uh, um, and mostly researchers, but we have also supporting staff. And we have these technolo technological platforms that have be, to be used not only by our researchers, but also in partnerships with other institutions, including the private sector. This is uh, our, infra our European infrastructure that supports some of these activities. And we have other uh, uh, partnerships, for instance, with the European Marine Board that uh, Sheila is the executive secretary with Euromarine, with European Aquaculture, also partnerships in the framework of ocean observation that I'll be talking more today, and a lot uh, of work on the science policy interfaces. This is also something that I'm very, very involved, but I'm not going to be talking about today, um, especially IPES and Eclipse. Uh, so IPES is the global platform and Eclipse the, the, the European. And we have a lot of um, activity in the bioeconomy. We launched the bioeconomy roadmap together. Of course, it was done together with other partners. Um, and we have a lot of other engagement with, uh, with, uh, with the public. Okay, uh, now going back to the marine of the biodiversity observations and really how to address the global scale? Well, the first question is why should we care about the global scale? Why, I mean, biodiversity is really much more, I mean, it's very local, we observe it. Uh, organisms are in a particular location. Why should we try to really um, have partnerships or networking or uh, uh, at global level? Well, that's because we have a, a lot of, um, conventions, a lot of legal binding um, uh, activities, a lot of uh, um, uh, organizations and, and so on that really are, are, are uh, at global level and, act, and need real information from the whole uh, globe. And I would like just to, uh, to point out this year, 2020, was supposed to really be a very big year for biodiversity. We were uh, planning the UN Decade for Ocean Sciences that starts next year. Um, and biodiversity was really a key part of this. Then we were supposed also to finish the, the agreement on the uh, biodiversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction. This is a, a new um, agreement between nations and the framework of UNCLOS really to allow the protection and for instance, um, protected areas in the areas beyond national jurisdiction. This is also the preparation for the UN of, of ecosystem restoration that also in, involves uh, marine ecosystem rec uh, restoration. We were supposed also to have the meeting that was uh, postponed in China in this October to really discuss what are we going to do in the post-2020. We had many targets um, that, we should have, uh, that we should have reached uh, in 2020. Most of them we didn't, but there is a really big discussion what to do from now on. And this was, uh, so a lot of energy has been uh, spent on this. Uh, this is uh, maybe February next year. Uh, we'll see if we if this is going to happen or when this is going to happen. Then the UN Convention on Climate Change. Uh, we've been working a lot now biodiversity and climate change because there is the understanding that this that uh, these things can be um, tackled in a in a synergistic way and uh, that uh, we should uh, have solutions that are win-win for biodiversity and for climate change. Then we have uh, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, the, the, the goal 14 that is um, the most important for the marine environment. Uh, we are supposed to have our UN OSHA conference in Lisbon during this year, it was also postponed. And at the European level, we had last year the, the launch of the uh, EU Green Deal. So this is a program 
or for the next years for the European Union. And this includes preserving a, 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 a goal that is preserving Europe's natural capital. And for that, we have to do, to, the Commission was supposed to launch the biodiversity strategy for 2030, and they did this this week. So I'm going just to uh, talk a little bit about it. So uh, this is uh, the president of the EU, and she, um, this is a, a quote, um, when, for, for the launch of this, uh, of this uh, strategy, biodiversity strategy, and uh, this, uh, and she says that really uh, making nature health healthy is really a very important and is at heart of the growth strategy for Europe, uh, the European Green Deal. This is um, for me very good that she says that even though we are in the middle of this COVID-19 crisis. So this was uh, actually a little bit postponed, but now it was launched and actually has a lot of very ambition, uh, ambitious goals. So why do we need to protect biodiversity? This is just uh, two or three reasons. Well, first, because it's very valuable. And this is not just in ecological terms, but also in economic terms. Second, because we are losing it very in a very fast rate, uh, rate, and this is really a very big concern. And also because there is an interdependence between uh, biodiversity loss and, and the climate crisis. So it's really important that both really um, get better. Uh, so the, these are just some numbers that are in the strategy. So protect 30% of land and sea in Europe. This is much, much more than we have now, especially in the sea. But not only that, but really 10% of land and 10% of sea should be strictly protected. This is not just soft protection. This should be really uh, um, strict uh, protection, so really, reduce uh, activities like fisheries and things like that. Then there are other uh, goals that are not so um, towards the ocean, but like planting three million uh, trees. And there, are, there is really the aim to get a lot of uh, funds diverted to uh, make these things possible. Also at the UN uh, level, so the global level, the commission will try really to set up um, and to negotiate um, ambitious goals for the uh, CBD uh, new uh, framework. So there is also this partnership that was launched on biodiversity. This is bringing together different biodiversity uh, concern initiatives, like for instance, biodiversity that is the consortium of national uh, funding agencies uh, that, uh, that has been uh, together to, to fund biodiversity uh, research, uh, bringing also platforms that already exist, science policy platforms and so on, really to improve the monitoring of biodiversity and, and services uh, across Europe. This is very much in line with what we want to do in MBON. Uh, then really get knowledge that is uh, support for, for policy making, um, working with businesses and, and really working also in nature-based solution development and so on. Uh, but even though we are starting a new research program next year uh, in, your, in the EU, uh, still, uh, this, this existing program, they open uh, a new call, this is new, uh, and for a Green Deal call, and this actually has a theme also on restoring biodiversity and ecosystem services. And actually you can really um, um, be involved in defining this call uh, until 3rd of June, you can participate in and, and give uh, your inputs for what this call should be. So what is the GeoBond MBON, so the Marine Biodiversity Observation Network from GeoBond? So this is, uh, these are the people that are uh, the last time, uh, the last year, last couple of years um, um, managing it. So uh, it's me, uh, Frank Mueller-Carter from uh, Florida University, from US, 
Marco Stella used to be in New Zealand and just came back to Europe and is now in the North University. And Masa uh, Nakawaka from uh, Hokkaido University in Japan. And then we just got a, a new secretariat that is going to start soon and actually was hired by the Air Center uh, in, so in, in Portugal. So they hire this uh, two people, 50% uh, two uh, time each, to help steer the, the geobond. So this is very exciting new phase for geo for mbond to really uh, pursue its objectives. So what are the, the objectives? So uh, mbond is not a new. Well, we don't want to be a new observing program. This would be very hard at a global scale. So what we want to do is promote a community of practice, a global one. Um, and this global community of practice will be bringing together the existing uh, communities of practice, some, sometimes working at the local level, sometimes they're already working at uh, national level. Uh, and uh, we have some <clears throat> Uh, global programs are already uh, for collection, curation, uh, analysis, and and so on, and and really making use of the of the of the biodiversity data that is collected. Then to promote marine biodiversity observation, because we think we still need more. Of course, we need more coordination. We need better. Uh, we need to, to do things better, but we still need to do more. Uh, ocean is very vast and we know very little about uh, marine biodiversity. So we still need, so we need to bring the community together to decide what are the major gaps and really try to focus on those gaps. Then promote best practices for marine biodiversity observation. This is what uh, pr sometimes is difficult to say what is the best practices, but at least bring together existing and trying to harmonize the practices of collecting data, of analyzing data and, and so on. And um, then promote really the, the publication as fast as possible of data free or free access. And of course, we are promoting, uh, MBON is promoting very much this uh, OBIS, the ocean, the just changed name, Ocean Biodiversity Information uh, System. And I'll talk about this a little bit later. Then uh, something we also want to pro are promoting is the integration of biological observations within other ocean observation systems and programs. So we, we need also other uh, variables that are not biological that should be measured at the same scales in the same place like temperature, like salinity, like uh, pH many, many other variables that we sometimes in our own uh, biodiversity programs, we have to measure them ourselves. <laughs> so it would be much better if these uh, observations and measurements were integrated. Then to support monitoring efforts, because we want really to have long-term uh, observations and not just do assessments. So we want also to support as far as we can uh, the monitoring offers uh, efforts in countries and regions. And then we want really to um, make sure or to, um, that our uh, the, the data and also the knowledge is produced with this data really gets to the people, the decision makers that can use that. Then of course our scientific objective is really to understand why and how life uh, in the ocean is changing. Um, and also how local uh, changes relate to, to changes in other scales like uh, regional and global. So now a personal story. Um, a few years ago, we got together a, a group that in, uh, to, to answer the question, how is climate change impacting kelp forests around the world? So this is uh, more or less easy kelp forest. These are uh, ecosystems dominated by brown um, macroalgae, and they uh, they can form very big uh, forests, and they are present in many places in the world. But they are quite well defined. They are quite easy to to study because you can dive. And they are they are located close to the coastal areas. 
when we tried to do that, we were surprised by the lack of long-term uh, data sets. There were still uh, much fewer than uh, we thought, and also that there was really a very big disparity, and people knew each other. This is a really small, uh, relatively small group, but still things were done in very different ways. Uh, so while we were doing this, so the, this was a, a project um, that was uh, funded by NCs in Santa Barbara in the US. So it brings people together, data, to analyze data and, and produce the results of this analysis. And we decided to create the KEEN, the Kelp Ecosystem Ecology Network. So uh, a global network to look, to monitor really kelp ecosystems and also to do some small experiments because we are always a bit ambitious. Uh, and really compare results at the world level. So, but of course, this is an example of very, just one ecosystem. When we want to do things at global level for all ecosystems, all the ocean and everything, what should we measure? We cannot do everything. So how do we come up with a prioritization or how can we come up with a method to, to decide what, we should prioritize. Okay, um, there is there are many ways of doing that, and of course, the more pragmatic is really to uh, look at what is there already, because we're not going to discard that, and also because people are going to continue to uh, monitor uh, what uh, they have been uh, doing. And then also to look at what are the requirements, what do we need to know? And when I say we, it's not necessarily only the scientists. The scientists are always looking for other different questions, and of course this is very interesting. But what are the other um, you know, stakeholders, the, the policy makers, the managers uh, that have to write reports, that have to, to, to um, know um, how uh, biodiversity is changing, how fishes is changing, how uh, coastal ecosystems are changing, what do they need to know? And then also to, to, to see what is feasible, uh, because we may want to know a lot of things uh, and may not have the technology uh, still ready to do it or the means to do it. Um, so for that, of course, we are uh, doing a lot of research on new uh, technologies and new equipment and so on. And of course, this has been uh, supported by a project for some of, for some of us. Okay, so, so there are some global uh, programs already. And I'm just <laughs> two examples here. This is the Continuous Plan Record Survey. This is probably the longest uh, running uh, program in the world. Um, as far as I know, maybe I'm wrong, and a lot of people believe it. So if anyone else knows another one that is longer, please let me know. And because it started, um, the first toe to really collect samples was done in 1931, and they basically did not stop until today. Of course, they changed a few things, but they did not uh, stop until today. So what they do, they use sheets of opportunity. So uh, and ask them to tow this device here that actually collects plankton. At the moment, they, they are using 20 volunteer ships and they are towing uh, <clears throat> 15 to 20,000 kilometers per month. So, um, so they, they, then they identify everything that was collected. That's something that is not easy not or cheap but um but so they have this data uh, base going back from decades so they really can see how things have changed in the last decades so these are the here in the north atlantic now there are other programs around the world but this is the area that has been more intensely sampled and these are, they are of course improving and, and adding things. For instance, one thing that they add that is now very interesting is that they start um, collecting also my, marine microplastics so they can also see the uh, differences in the last uh, two decades. 
And they're also now measuring uh, also some uh, other um, uh, parameters, non-biological non parameters that really then help to understand what's happening. Then what the, there is, for instance, this other one, this, uh, the, the rocky shores are, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the coastal ecosystems are very, <clears throat> that are the easiest really to to monitor so they are used a lot uh, by programs and this is one of them that is tracking global rocky and, and biodiversity so what they do is they have a very a global a globally standardized method that they and they can sometimes train people but all the people that do this these are volunteers a lot of them are scientists but they do that in a volunteer way. And then all the data is shared and so they can see what's happening around the world. This is another example. This is not an international one. This is a, a program we have in, at CMAR, uh, also with shift of opportunities. So with this company, mainly with this company, uh, Transinsular, they do, um, they do, they do routes of, uh, cargo. So these are cargo ships that go to the Azores, to Madeira Islands, Canary Islands, and Cape Verde Islands, and also go to uh, sometimes to uh, Africa. And so they take observers on board. And these observers are, are mainly volunteer observers. And so, of course, this is a way to collect. I mean, it would be impossible to have this number of hours of observers in a research program because this will be just too expensive. So this is a way to collect data. This is going on this year, had to be interrupted. We have data now until 2019. And then we can do a lot of, we've done a lot of things, including trying to uh, understand what are the, uh, the preferences in terms of habitat of the distant species that we see. So, but how then uh, should we, um, these are all very um, targeted uh, programs. How can we decide what should we uh, observe at the global level? So this um, process was done actually by GUS that we work very much with, uh, the bio, uh, biology and ecology panel. So GUS is the global ocean observing system. And what uh, they did is they did this matrix uh, and they tried to find what were the most uh, important things that, uh, and this was the policy that makers need to know. So at global level for global um, uh, conventions like uh, the CBD or for, for um, national um, questions and so on. And, um, and uh, things that were needed also for, for management of marine resources. And then they also uh, looked at feasibility. And they tried to identify those that were, have high impact and high feasibility. And um, feasibility means that you could do it in a, a credible way and of course even better if it was cost effective uh, way. And they come up with this uh, first four, uh, eight groups. So these are tax, uh, broadly taxonomic groups of species and also of habitats. Uh, and then they have two others that the community, when this came out, they say, well, we also need the venting invertebrates. They are very, very important, especially for deep sea, we cannot have a program like this without this benthic and also the microbial diversity. Of course, they were not selected immediately because of the feasibility, but they are really the engine of the ocean. So it's really important that we start to understand better what's going on there. Uh, in, our, in the other hand, the geobon, so this is about all biodiversity, it's not only marine biodiversity. So they uh, follow another route, or we follow another route, and really start looking at what was important to know for all ecosystems. So uh, all ecosystems, they have, there are some principles that are valid for all ecosystems, all communities. And so they came up with uh, a completely different 
set of essential variables. Well, this is a problem because it is very hard to uh, explain to stakeholders that we are trying to, to convince that these are the essential things that should be measured and should be observed in the ocean, but we have two lists. Uh, and uh, we actually have a lot of people, uh, we have several um, people that work for both panels, but really because how things were, were um, discussed, I mean one is, biodiver is the biodiversity axis, biodiversity across all realms, across all the ecosystems, and the other one is the, the ocean axis, so only focus on the ocean and, and, and what is important for the marine environment. Really they came up, so we actually been working together, um, well since the start uh, from uh, from we, uh, Geobon and Bon started a bit before, so when Goose Bioeco Panel was founded, we started immediately working with them. And so we came up with a concept of how these two things really fit together. And so the measurements and the observations we do can fit both uh, um, essential variables. Um, I'm not going to give any details because this will be a kind, kind of long, but oh, we are uh, just an example of how we work together. We have this um, paper um, written by the European Marine Board, and we have this working group, and we have people from both panels actually working together. We came, I mean, this was really not a problem to bring, to come up with um, recommendations, how to fill the gaps on a ocean observation, biological observation, and so on. So what are the challenges to go global and not only to go global, but operational? So this, the communities are still quite isolated, um, very uneven geographic distribution of, of observation. So we have uh, some regions that are quite well uh, known relatively, others really very little. Um, then the, the mature networks, usually there are local or at most national. Uh, so there are a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, data we have. Actually, these are efforts of individuals or individual groups or labs. So it's really hard to um, bring every, everyone together. Then of course, there is a lot of heterogeneity in technology, capacity, funding, and so on. Um, then best practices are in discussion and so on. Um, one big uh, problem has been re the reliance on volunteer work that is very common on for these uh, networks. So, uh, and so, so these are not funded in a sustainable way. So, uh, so the question is, if we cannot go immediately global, is ocean basin? Uh, useful scale like the Atlantic, for instance. So, of course, we can go, uh, one way to go is thematic, and this is what uh, Goose Bioeco is doing. So, they define these different um, ecosystems and groups of organisms, and they are bringing together the experts from around the world on these um, areas, and they uh, decide what are uh, the the, the best practices, how they're going to publish the data, how, uh, what are the priorities and so on. So theme by theme. We can also do it as uh, it was done in the US, for instance, where uh, they, they got funding for demonstration pro projects. So they have case studies on several locations, different ecosystems. And they try to demonstrate the best way to really bring together different kinds of data and then produce maps, produce things that can be used, used, used by uh, non-scientists. And then also how you can, go, can you go from this case that is at national level for a more global level. And, you, and what happened is uh, I like this uh, project very much because it was kind of a follow up. And uh, they, uh, with the um, partnership from uh, different organizations from the Americas, they decide to go uh, uh, for this program, Multiple to the Americas to really expand 
the range of ecosystems um, that we covered, but using what was uh, learned and then discussing the different communities from the different countries, in, in, mostly in South and Central America, to also then uh, discuss the methods, uh, discuss, and uh, actually there was um, training not only on 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 uh, on collecting data, but also on um, publishing this data for, uh, in this case, for our hobbies, um, and also to use uh, published data and publish uh, data sets to really um, produce products that were uh, important for local and uh, national authorities. So this was done through. Um, uh, workshops. Uh, one was cancelled, unfortunately, this year. But really, to go from uh, also from local to global, and and again from global data sets to local infographics, maps, and so on. So the idea, if, if you want to go for the Atlantic pole to pole, was really to build the same kind of structure in the other side of the Atlantic and really cooperate with this one. And we can do this, for instance, in the framework of Atlantos. Uh, I just wanted to finish by uh, talking about OBIS, because uh, if we want to really have a global platform, one thing that we, is very good is to have a place where all this data is really published and is available. So it's not only freely available, but is findable, is interoperable, and all these things. And so OBIS was until very recently the Ocean Biogeographic Information System, but it was just renamed, I think also this week or really recently, uh, to really uh, show that it's more widely now um, um, publishing data on biodiversity, not just georeferenced uh, species data as they were at the beginning. And these slides were actually um, provided by the project manager uh, very recently. So they have uh, partnerships with different organizations, including the MBON and the GOOS, uh, to really uh, not only uh, publish the data, but also to really do uh, uh, products uh, for policymakers, scientists, and other organizations. That the, so they can use the products from uh, built with the data that uh, is uh, stored and maintained in OBIS. Uh, <clears throat> um, these are some statistics. So uh, many million records. We could all almost say the, why do we need more data? But actually, this is very very uneven, geographically by depth and so on. Uh, and uh, really, the, the idea is that we go from observations to data, to information, and to knowledge. And this is our examples where OBIS really was uh, involved for the first uh, global marine assessment, for instance, and the uh, IPBES global assessment. So they were really providing um, not only data, but for instance, maps and so on. They also uh, they also support this Atlas of Marine Life that is European. There are talks that maybe will um, increase its range also. And is really increasing. Oh, uh, actually, they are also very instrumental when there was these uh, workshops to bring together, to try to identify the areas, ecological or bio, the EPSAs, ecological or bio, biological significant marine areas. And they are growing. They have now many nodes around the world collecting data that then um, goes to the central, uh, to the international hub. And also, uh, we can see here uh, the number of data. Well, it's now decreasing a little bit, but really uh, increasing over the time. And uh, the, also, to the another thing that they changed in the last years was uh, they were publishing data on species, uh, georeference, and now they publish many other uh, data like biomass, abundance, uh, 
composition. Uh, so they really restructure the whole database to be able to do much more than species occurrence. And of course, they, uh, they uh, really allow a lot of publications to happen. And this for our researchers is really important because in the end, this is our uh, prize, let's say. And I'd like to thank you. And uh, if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you very much, Isabel. I don't know if you want to stop sharing your screen, maybe. Yes, okay. Okay, thank you very much. So we've got a couple of questions, which I see in the question and answer section. Um, the first one is from Patience Obatola and she's from Nigeria. She says um, she's very interested in the presentation and she'd like to know the strategies um, that you use in MBON um, in actualizing your objective for this program. How do you make it happen? Well, what, uh, what we do, of course, uh, as I said, we are, not, we are not an organization with uh, a lot of funding and things like that. So we um, organize, uh, well, we have, for instance, a webinar every, every month where we try to really, uh, well, what we're doing here, networking of the community, really um, um, present what has been happening, discuss also what's been happening. We, we were supposed to have a meeting now in July that again, it's going to be online, so this is not going to be postponed uh, to discuss exactly, I mean, how uh, to continue to discuss harmonization of methods, what is going on. But then of course, what we do is try to, to get funding for, to test some of these things. And the funding, well, I, I, I gave some examples. Uh, we also have some st uh, projects starting now in Europe that are not so much focused on these objectives, but will help also uh, these objectives. Uh, well, we have EUROC also that um, is, uh, may help also um, to, to foster this, but this is a network, as I said. So our really our um, aims are really to bring the community together, not to to do and then of course do things. So for that we need the funding, and this we bring, we put projects together to really with the community to really uh, move forward. Thank you very much. Um, there is a question from. Teresa Dukubo, um, and she's asking if researchers outside of Europe will be welcome to the Horizon 2020 Green Deal call. And I guess that depends, usually depends on who um, paid into it in, such, in a sense, in that sense. I don't know if you want to uh, answer to that. Well, actually, I did not look into details of this particular call. So a lot of, we have uh, these calls from the Atlantic so where are you from? Um, yeah. Oh, she uh, doesn't say, yeah. So these were actually projects that we yeah, we had to have people. And actually we have a lot of program, a lot of calls now in the, in this EU programs that you need to have, that they are targets with different regions. So they need to have always European researchers, of course, but they also sometimes is a must for, for these Atlantic projects, for instance, it was a must to have Brazilian and South African. Uh, and then others were very welcome, welcome Namibia, Cape Verde, Argentina, you know. So, and I mentioned this because I know that these are partners from these projects, but other, of course, others are welcome as well. Um, so, and, this program from the Atlantic, I know that the only, I think the only countries that don't, do not receive money from the, from the EU are the US and Canada. And this actually has been a problem before. But all the others really can be, can receive funding and uh, be partners, full partners. I mean, exactly the same as the Europeans on these projects. Um, I, I can just add, if you look um, in the, there was a question about where you can find information about the call and I put the uh, website in there. And just looking at the, 
the, the website, there's one on accelerating the clean energy transition and access in partnership with Africa. So yeah. there is more than just Europe in there and you'd have to read through all of this to actually see where, you know, outside of Europe partners are available or, or allowed to participate or not. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, sorry. No, yeah, I, just, no, no. I just gave an example that I had to do with biodiversity. Really, there are many areas on this new deal call. Uh, I did not, I don't remember which, which were the other ones, but mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, yeah, it must be really easy. If not, you just contact me and I'll find this information, the links for you. Um, there's a related question here from Oludare Adio. Adiogun, I'm sure I'm completely ruining your name there. Um, yes, thank you very much, he, she. Um, it's very ins instructive um, and thanks in Isabel for your presentation. And then he, she asks, uh, what level of support is your organization offering developing countries, particularly Africa and ecosystem restoration and data sharing? Well, I don't know what you mean by uh, support. So. <laughs> Financial support we cannot offer at least for now uh, because we don't have that kind of support. But the support we can offer is really help, for instance, to write proposals and really help to identify. This is what we are doing. I was even today with a former colleague of mine from IPES that asked me information about this call that we have in Geobone for for the, this biodiversity in the cloud and. Um, so we can give that, that kind of support. And now with the secretariat, really, because we have, we are busy people, some, sometimes we are, it's, it takes a little longer to respond. But uh, yeah, this is the kind of support that we can give. And um, yeah, so there are funding, there is funding available, but we need to look for it and we need to apply. Okay, um, then there is a question um, from Rui Figuera, who says, how uh, would you rate the readiness of the marine research community to adopt and use data tools like data standards and protocols to facilitate data sharing? Um, and is there any area that needs to be prioritized for capacity enhancement? The readiness of the, to adopt. <laughs> Okay, well, it depends. You have all kinds. I mean, I think uh, the readiness of the, uh, well, we, the biodiversity community has been uh, not as quick as other communities like uh, the meteorological community in really working together and releasing data because the data is so much harder to get. I mean, if you need to identify a species or something like that, it could be years of one, and, and so it's been more difficult, but I think we are advancing a lot, actually. I'm, um, it's not that every, all, all the problems are solved, but we are advancing. And also because now there is, it's possible to, for instance, and we have done that uh, also with my students, to publish the data sets. And this is like a publication. And then you have actually publication that's really, um, Detail uh, with some detail really says which this database is, how it was collected, all the methods and everything. So people that want to use it really have all the information. And I think this is actually happening, that things are getting easier. Uh, but still, it's, uh, we still need a lot of work. And people really need to see the benefits they have in doing this. Uh, if I may add to that, I think quite often people have spent quite a lot of time and effort getting these databases, their data, you know, getting their data in some sort of format. And then, um, yes, there's a, there's a good reason for people to, to have all of this data available. But if nobody, if you don't get referenced for the data that you've collected, I think that I've been in that position and it really annoys me when you see a publication that's used your information but hasn't re referenced you. So I yeah. think sure having a DOI for your data set makes a big difference. And then you can have something really to say, well, you didn't reference my data. So there's a problem with this paper. Yeah, exactly. No, something that will make a difference. 
Yeah, and this and, and this has been always my point. I mean, you just you cannot just tell people, oh, give me your data because that's the right thing to do. I mean, you need to really uh, see how you because you don't want to lose people that go to the field and get data. You don't want to have just people on the computer harvesting data that that people put in the databases. Also, but something that I would like to say is that it's not as easy as it sounds, and I said this to Ward many times, uh, to really publish this data in this uh, global data set. So they are, they are having a lot of capacity building events, uh, also mo mostly targeted from uh, um, some, uh, some regions, but really because we need to train people. And this is the poll to poll. Uh, this was something they did. Uh, they bring the people together, those scientists that are very good at collecting, um, going to the field and, and really train them to really publish this data the right way and in always, because this is not so easy. I mean, it's easy after you know, but <laughs> this is not, and so if you're very busy, you have so many things to do, this, you're not going to take the time. So if we really want this to be available so other people can use it, this is such a valuable data that, especially if you took so long to get it, I mean, mm -hmm. it should be used as much as possible. Yeah. So this we need to work and they need to work and make it more friendly. Uh, I think <laughs> more friendly for the people that are going to put the data there. Um, okay, then we have a um, question from Gotstam James who asks, how do you communicate your findings to policymakers and justify the relevance, the re relevance of your work to humanity? Well, <laughs> don't get me <laughs> not a, no. It's not a small well, I mean, question, that one. <laughs> no, yeah, well, this is, uh, well, this is a process. Uh, I, didn't, I was planning to work to talk on biodiversity, on uh, IPES, for instance, but uh, obviously there was no time. I um, mean, this, uh, this is a way, so it's, it's a very official and formal way, but this is uh, one of the right ways. So it's a very, bit heavy, but the, 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 the governments really ask the questions and we get the information um, they need. But of course, when I say we, I mean, we also interact with the governments to let them know what are the important questions. And, and this is, um, I mean, this is an ongoing, ongoing, and this is a, a this is a iterative process. It's not just a, a one way, this is a two way communication at, at different levels from managers, practitioners to policymakers. And I think you need to have, not maybe yourself all the time, but really have in your group, in your institution, someone that can really can do, make this bridge. Because um, also, I mean, biodiversity is in trouble. And so we, we need data, not just for our science. We, to, pr to promote our research, we really need this to get those people that are responsible to to take action and to decide so they they do the right thing for for nature thank you then we have two more questions the um the first one uh, well the first one that i'll ask is um by suleiman sadiku um any study on the effect of anthropogenic activities on biodiversity um, especially oil exploration and exploitation. So I'm assuming there's loads of those. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but the thing is that we discussed this, uh, having another uh, set of essential variables that actually look and monitor the impacts instead of just the biodiversity. We are not doing that. So we just have to see, you know, to monitor the before and after and see how things change. Uh, but so in MBON, of course, a lot of researchers do that. Uh, I'm talking about the MBON, what it's doing and what it's promoting. But if you have really a monitoring program going on, then you can see really the difference if you be, uh, between what was 
there before and after. So that's very, very important. Um, okay, and then we have one last question, which was one of the first questions actually, but it was a question that I didn't know that you would be able to answer. The question is from Nuno Minu Minuas. Simoes. Simoes. Yeah, there we go. There we go. From Mexico, who asks, um, uh, will the slides be available? Um, so, uh, will the presentation be available for sharing? I'm assuming that actually. This is recorded and, and is being put on YouTube. So at least the recording will be on YouTube. And I'm not sure if Isabel, you're okay with sending, giving your slides. Yeah, sure. The thing is that I still have to check if they are all, because I put, you know, the name, many of the slides were given to me by different colleagues. Oh, names. Yeah. And so, yeah. And so what I need to check is that they, they are all acknowledged. I think most of them, but I have to check. Uh, other than that, then there is no problem. Yeah, yeah so I think maybe um, I'm assuming that the Air Center can send out a link to that when, when it's ready for the slides. Yeah. Um, and then we have some panelists. I don't know if any of the panelists who actually can't write any questions. If you have any questions, now is the time to unmute yourself and ask your question. No? I'll, I will ask my question then. How, what is the next steps for IPBS? I see that they've just received a good, um, uh, what's it called, uh, prize um, from Sweden. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. What is the next steps for, for well, IPBS? The next steps, uh, we are going to organize something. Uh, it's completely new. We are going to organize a workshop on biodiversity and pandemics really because of this COVID-19. Of course, our procedures uh, did not foresee exactly this, but actually we'll do it in the framework of uh, the scoping of an, an assessment that was uh, already ongoing, that is for the nexus. So nexus between biodiversity, food, water, and uh, health. So this was already being, uh, we, we organize the scoping for that assessment. And actually we are going to do so, so a sub section of that, just uh, pandemics. And this will be in July. We are now, uh, there was an open call for nominations of uh, experts. So it will be very short because this will be published in September. So will go for review on Oct in August. So it will be really very short um, uh, time. So just to bring uh, together the existing knowledge, uh, what we have, and also hopefully because I'm um, I'm chairing the knowledge and data task force, and this task force one of the aims is really to get the knowledge gaps that are identified in IPES and really try to get funding to, for research to fill these gaps. Mm -hmm. So if we can already have gaps really identify on this, may, then we will try to get funding on research to fill these gaps. Very good. And then I think we've got one new question that's come in. Um, are they from Uy. Uyronko Uyusola Adek? Really? Um, are there any collaborative research and policy implementation planned for endangered marine species in um, countries in Africa? Research and policy and well, I I may not be the best person. But I can indicate uh, people in Africa they are they are doing just that. For instance, like David Obura in Kenya and others that are really doing a lot of work on this. Uh, they are working with uh, policy makers and also with research to, to do this with so the coral. Um, David is uh, very, very focused on coral reefs, but also in other, other species. And they are, he started, he's a part of his Goose Bioeco panel and also in Bonn. Uh, and but he's of course very much uh, targeting Africa. That's where he lives and works. 
Okay, thank you very much. I think those are all the questions. And if we don't have, I think we're um, pretty much over our time anyway. So if we have no other questions, I want to thank Isabel again um, for a great talk. And I want to thank the Air Center for saying thank you very much for, for organizing these. They're uh, a really good way for me to spend a Friday afternoon. <laughs> So it's always good to, to hear something new on a Friday. It's already done. I still have another one coming. So, <laughs> um, so yes, thank you very much. Thank you every, for all our participants for, for listening and for your questions. Um, there is another question. Can they have your contacts? I guess. Uh, yes, it was. In the, find you. It was twice. I, no, actually at the end of my presentation. Okay. But I'm sure that the Air Center also, I mean, can, yeah. can give the contacts. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Thank you very much. And um, we'll see you again next Wednesday. Oh, sorry, next Friday. Yes, exactly. <laughs> For okay. the next Air Center talk. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.